Good morning. My name is Dale Ballisfield, and I'm a unique combination of a herbalist and um, a nurse. So I'm something of the new hybrid model of healthcare. I've been trained in integrative oncology, which means that I can put together uh, a range of interventions for people that have many different health situations. But today we're going to talk about herbs and supplements for breast health. And I want to just emphasize that there are many opportunities to intervene and we'll be talking about two of my favorites, both the unique herbs and supplements which have the most scientific studies behind them. I've, I've edited some of these so I won't be going through all of them of which there are numerous ones to help. And there's also many foods but that's a topic for another, another uh, program. So. My information is uh, based on my research, and I encourage you to do your own research. But, so today we're going to be talking about an overview, a little bit of what cancer is, um, the ways that it grows, and where you can intervene in its life cycle. We'll talk a little about the safety issues that are in and around uh, herbs and supplements, of which the popular press is often um, quick to jump on how unsafe they are or how much they inter interfere with medication. And so we'll address some of those issues in this talk today. Then we're going to introduce the concept of targeted therapies, which is where medicine is heading now. And we'll talk about maybe five of them that are out there which target certain things on the cancer cell and many things that you might think of as chemos are actually targeted therapies and this leads us into really personally personalized treatment for your um, your cancer and other conditions but this is where medicine is going which is where holistic treatment has always been it's personally specific to you we'll also address, address a few herbs and a few supplements and um, how they are uh, working in terms of breast cancer and we'll go into a little of their impact and at what level they will um, will be working in the cancer since there's not just one type of breast cancer but there's several so on our integrative medicine wheel all of these approaches um, it's really an all-inclusive a way to look at healing and along with the personalized program I want to talk about the specifics of herbal medicine and nutritional medicine um, for breast health for breast cancer prevention and how it is unique to each person so we'll be focusing on all of the within many of the integrative approaches we'll be focusing on the botanicals and the nutritionals not the dietaries or any of the lifestyle and wonderful mind-body uh, programs that I'm sure are posted on this site again we're going to be matching you to your medicine I can't emphasize that enough so in terms of uh, promotions uh, the pink ribbon promotion is a wonderful thing and it does uh, target and trigger people's in people's minds the breast cancer um, fight and awareness and raises that those kinds of issues but I want you to be cautious about other kinds of promotions especially around some of the foods where what it will promote in certain situations here is breast cancer so things that are high in sugar and high in carbohydrates and high in chemicals um, are not things that you want to encourage even though it's tempting because it looks like you're supporting the the cause by eating them or buying them so these are things that um, do not help you a little bit about cancer before we start um, basically cancer is a unique kind of entity it is our own cells but that they have forgotten their instructions cancer cells just forgot how to grow normally and then they forgot how to die normally so one of the some of the hallmarks of cancer growth is that it just keeps going it doesn't pay attention to signals from cells and other hormones around it to stop it continues to divide it resists the normal signs to um, to end its life and 
it manages to continue to grow by recruiting chemicals uh, and nutrients to build blood supply to help it spread to other areas of the body. So while this looks like a terrifying thing, it does offer us many opportunities in this life pattern, life cycle pattern, to intervene. And it's all about changing the inner terrain so that the cancer really doesn't have a great opportunity to grow within. And just as we can, you know, weed our garden and change our uh, landscape um, in our house, around our house, we can do that within as well. So this talk also will encourage you, I hope, to enhance your prevention, improve your treatment response if this is something that you're going through, reduce treatment side effects, and overall improve the quality and quantity of your life. So this is just a little visual about what I had just mentioned, the different steps in cancer's uh, growth pattern, <clears throat> its ability to, uh, <clears throat> to continue to grow, insensitivity to growth signals, etc. So we're going to talk about the safety. You hear a lot about how dangerous herbs are, but the reality is that they're quite safe. Um, from what we have gathered from the data, really it looks like only about 40 people uh, die a year from herbs. And that's based on at least 70 some million people, million Americans that are taking herbs who are not going to see an herbalist who are self-prescribing, etc. Uh, that's a very, very low risk. Many, many more people die from the correct use of prescription medication. But none, be that as it may, you want to be safe and you want to be having guidance in terms of which herbs you use, how you take them, where you get them, and um, what you should be using them with. So these things are super safe but you want to make sure that you are getting your information from a professional. So this is a, a, a funny cartoon about how the FDA is regulating safety coded caplets of eyes of new. Well, you hear that the FDA doesn't regulate herbs and supplements, and that's not accurate. It does regulate them, and uh, it's not in the same way that they regulate foods and drugs. It's a different category, and but they are regulated. And the FDA is also responsible for pulling them from the marketplace if the packaging makes um, claims that are not accurate and if it if the product has been found to have poor safety standards um, and if the manufacturing processes don't meet up with, the re with their requirements. So there is regulation, but because there's very, very few uh, problems with them, the FDA actually focuses on other areas in our food chain that are much more um, unsafe, like contaminated meats and vegetables, etc. So there's uh, bring, this brings me to another issue where you may have heard about the problem of interference of antioxidants, whatever that means, during chemo and radiation. And antioxidants, that word, means that it protects against oxidative damage, whether it's a food or a supplement or an herb, etc. But um, so this has led lots of doctors to tell their patients to avoid the use of antioxidant compounds during chemo and radiation. However, the data don't support that, uh, that claim of interference or harm. In fact, that of all the studies and uh, many, many patients reviewed, there was no um, evidence of any problem of any antioxidant. And within that narrow definition, they have included vitamin C, vitamin E, um, and some other, vitamin A, uh, of interfering with chemo. Not only did it not interfere, but it actually helped to improve um, the response to treatment, reduce side effects, helped uh, prevent the cancer-causing effect of some of the chemos, and, um, and it reduced some of the, the harm from the therapies itself. So um, many of your physicians may be wary of it, but if you want, you can show them the data. And I have cited everything in this talk, 
and it's at the end I have all of my references. So we're going to talk about what the concept of targeted therapies mean. So in addition to chemo and radiation and surgery, there are actually specific drugs which are called target therapies. What they do is that they're on the cell, on the cancer cell, there are little receptors, very much like a, um, a lock in a door, and the drugs come into that, those little receptors and they, they bind to it and they interrupt the growth patterns at this little molecular level of the cancer. So the drugs tamoxifen, Herceptin, Arimidex, these are breast cancer drugs, hit some of these pathways and they are person specific treatments because not everybody is hormone positive or um, HER2 positive which is the Herceptin target. Wonderfully enough herbs and supplements hit these and many other targets because plants and the supplements are molecular multitaskers and that means that they hit lots of different targets. The, usually the drugs just hit one but the plants they are much more complex and uh, as are the supplements and they can hit many and that's what we want to include along with your medications. So plants they have both macronutrients and micronutrients but they also um, impact many things within the cell. They help protect against DNA damage, they help uh, protect against degenerative diseases and um, many humans and animals can't make a lot of the compounds that the plants make. So by eating them or by taking them as supplements we take them into us. We have a really nice relationship with them. What they're finding out now is that there's at least 25,000 different cancer preventive compounds, they call them phytochemicals, identified in plants. This is really distinct from their nutritional value, the ma macro and micronutrients like their starches and proteins and, and calories, etc., which are the micro and macro nutrients. So these other compounds they're finding out um, have impact in our bodies in wonderful ways and even many of the chemo drugs are plant derived and concentrated. So things like vincristine and vinblastine, etc., are directly um, derived from plants. But in many ways, all of our life is directly connected to it, to plants. This slide talks about how breast cancer is not one condition. They, this Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which provided this. Um, considers it 10 different diseases, but they're basically grouped as four. The luminal A, one is, that's the one that we most hear of, which is the hormone responsive cancers. These are the ones that are estrogen and progesterone positive. The luminal B one is the ones that are, have all three things, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. Then there's just the HER2, and then there's one that's called triple negative which has none of those markers and that one seems to be the most um, perplexing to treat because they haven't they don't have um, medication they don't have a targeted treatment for that so this is again where the plants and supplements can really shine and if you have a triple negative cancer definitely include some of these uh, compounds to follow so that you can do the best that you can to help protect yourself and again change your inner landscape. So this, this slide shows that there are targeted therapies in the works now. At the top of this chart, the estrogen and progesterone targets, we know some of those, the HER2 targets, etc. This just shows that there are um, pharmaceuticals out there and there, some of them are still in the developmental stage that target different compounds on the cancer cell. This is a, a visual. I always love to have visuals. So this is basically this blue ball is our cell and there's a cut through to show like a window to look into it to show the nucleus, the purple nucleus inside. And you see these little kind of knobby things on the outside and these are receptors of some sort and compounds from either drugs, plants, foods, hormones floating around in your body will lock onto these little 
knobby things, and it will start a chain of reactions, both good or bad, that can lead to aspects into the nucleus that can impact whether the cell continues to grow or not. And obviously in cancer cells you want it to not grow. So some of these targets, this, um, the targets that are listed here, all of these cancer pathways are involved in the growth of cells, both cancer and, and non-cancer cells. And the ones, I don't know if you can see the ones that are in pink, uh, aromatase, BRCA1 and 2, the ER receptor, the HER2 nu, mTOR, and PARP, those are ones, and VEGF at the bottom, those are ones that they have drugs for, and um, the ones in green are additional ones that a lot of the plant compounds um, can help with. And we'll talk about these. So the first is aromatase, and you can see in this little schematic that aromatase initially starts from the chain beginning with cholesterol, and then it leads on down, and aromatase actually helps to make estrogen out of the other hormone, the male hormone, testosterone. So aromatase is something that for people who have estrogen positive cancers that they want to block. So there, um, there are many compounds that do that. The drugs, Arimidex, Flamara, Aromacin, are already out there. These are, es these are aromatase blockers. But all these plant compounds here, all of these herbs and foods that are listed underneath are comp are, have compounds that also block aromatase within them. So the whole idea is to bring these compounds or bring these plant medicines into your, um, your diet. In the case of white button mushrooms, walnuts, berries, uh, soy, genistein, etc. Or as supplements, um, passion flower, propolis, black cohosh, etc. So we won't be going into the specifics of all of these, but this is an overall view of some of the things that have uh, been found to have these targets uh, in them. The next is estrogen. Estrogen um, is found on some of the cell surfaces. And that, if that is true for your breast cancer, then you would be considered estrogen positive. Some cancers don't have those, and that would mean that you're estrogen negative. So estrogen receptors, these things on, this, on your cancer cell, um, would be marked with a plus or a minus on the pathology report. And we have drugs that target those. They're anti-estrogen drugs. Tamoxifen, Faslodex, Raloxifene are those that are out pharmaceutically. But there are, again, many plant compounds or supplements that have those anti-estrogen compounds in them. So again, these are things that you would want to include. Vitamin D, resveratrol, etc., fish oils, many, many things, beans and legumes. So that this is, again, an overview. We won't be going into every single one of these. But some of them we'll get to later on in the talk. This one is HER2. You may have heard of that or not. It's on most of the cells and um, some and, and cancer cells too, but when it's overexpressed, you're called HER2 positive. HER2 is a growth promoting protein. And the drug that blocks that is called Herceptin. So if your cancer has that excess HER2 on it, then you're given Herceptin. But again, because the plants are multitaskers, here are many other compounds or foods or plants that have uh, compounds in them that will block Herceptin. Again, include them in your life and in your diet. This one is NFKB, which stands for Nuclear Factor Kappa Beta. And it's a big bad one because this takes care of, this is involved in cancer survival growth, invasion, angiogenesis, which means recruiting, recruiting blood supply, and metastasis, which means spread. This is a bad one. So these are things that are uh, present in most cancers. The drugs, they don't have a drug yet out for it that targets nuclear factor kappa beta. They're still in the research stage. But a lot of the plant compounds Many, many, many have been found to block that. They have done studies on a lot of these compounds, and um, they can see that they 
block these uh, nuclear factor kappa beta uh, proteins in research. So again, we have cruciferous vegetables, we have um, certain fruits, we have cloves, spices, and more. This is continuous. There's lots of compounds. And so these are things I want to see if you have cancer or if you're at high risk for cancer um, or if you're recovering and you're, you're cancer-free but want to ensure that you stay that way. These are things that you want to include in your life. The next is P53, which is a really wonderful gene. It's a tumor suppressor gene. And um, it helps the cell die. But in most cancers, including almost a, a quarter of breast cancers, this particular gene is mutated. The drugs are that they're study they're still studying drugs for it, but there's none that are have been approved. However, many again, many plant pounds, food supplements um, have been found to protect protect this gene and um, reduce its, its option, uh, chance of being mutated. Here's one, just a study about vitamin D and how vitamin D has been a target for, um, for protecting the P53 mutation. The next one is something called VEGF, and that stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. And again, that means that it's a compound that the tumor cell uses, and also healthy cells use it, to recruit new uh, compounds to make blood vessels. So this is used positively in wound repair and it's also used during pregnancy to grow new cells for the baby, but uh, cancer, we don't want it. So when it is overexpressed, the cancers will grow and spread. There is a drug for it now, a target called Avastin. But again, like we've heard earlier, there are many other compounds that can block this uh, growth factor when it's not wanted. Again, many. Um, some of these things we will be talking about later on in the presentation, like milk thistle, and some, um, and tramides, which is a mushroom, and some you may have heard about um, um, Google or green tea that we may not be going into in detail right now. So again, apigenin is something that is, uh, this is a study that is, um, it's in chrysanthemum tea and it's in uh, propolis from the bees. Again, this shows that this inhibits that. So, so. We're going to now get into the heart of this presentation, which are some of the specific herbs that, um, that will be helpful. So this is obviously a chimpanzee. This is not a delicious breakfast for him or her. This is animal using um, herbal medicine. And there's a whole new science out there called zoopharmacognosy. And it's about how animals self-medicate with herbs. And it looks like most animals, from the most insignificant worms to the more advanced ones like um, monkeys, do treat themselves using plants. So in humans, we have been using herbal medicine since the beginning of our time as humans and prior to that, it looks like. It's our oldest form of healthcare and we have a written record going back thousands of years, at least to the beginning of writing. 5,000 years, there was Sumerian record about garlic and in Egyptian papyri. Um, the traditional Chinese medicine system, which has been in continuous use for 4,000 years, again, is, has herbal medicine as the foundation of it, as does the Ayurvedic tradition in India, at least 2,500, maybe even more years. Now, at least 25%, 20 percent of our drugs still come from uh, these plant compounds, though more and more have been um, made just in the lab, not from plant-based. In its day, these herbals were the medical books of their day. You can see there's very old ones going back to, you know, 65 AD and, and others from all over the world, Mexico, Spain, Mediterranean, etc. Today, 80% of the world is still using herbal medicine as a primary treatment, except in the West, we don't really acknowledge it as much, though there has been an herbal renaissance 
in the past 20 or so years, but it's, it's um, used often as a substitute for drugs, and that's not really how we like to think about it. So lots of Americans, again, this is the average of 70-some million people, are currently using it. Many physicians and nurses refer um, their patients to use supplements, which are great. And in fact, until about 150 years ago, physicians were herbalists because that was what was available. Here is a Chinese apothecary where they're, they're co compounding a formula using some of the um, dried material. So herbal medicine, which is the art and science of using herbs to promote health and prevent and treat illness, really involves a lot. Biology, botany, biochemistry, etc. Um, we have co-evolved with the plants and we have a basic dialogue where we breathe out what they need to live, they breathe out what we need to live. So that's in the oxygen and carbon dioxide dance, basically, that we have with the plants. But even more than that, I have talked about those secondary compounds that help us, and they are bioactive within us. But many doctors are not trained in herbal medicine and because of the, um, the poor press about it and lack of understanding. They have a lot of skepticism, and that's fine. But there are some of us who are trained and gone through lots of training in it, and we understand um, how to work with the plants and how to work with them with you. And it needs a teamwork. So this would be the best for all of us, for, for us to have a team that involved um, herbalists and involved uh, people that were trained in integrative oncology and integrative nutrition. So here's some, at least the ones that I could dig up of the many, many plants that are involved in uh, cancer prevention or intervention. The ones in pink, which may be hard to see here, I'll be going through, there'll be maybe five or six of them. This beautiful one is black cohosh. We'll go through these alphabetically. It's native to the woods, stretching from Canada to Georgia, and it has much activity. We use it um, both for menopausal symptoms and for pain relief and for blood pressure, but in breast cancer, it does inhibit the cell growth and it reduces converting estrogen to active, a type of estrogen precursor to active estrogen. There are some good studies that I have uh, cited here, and um, it, you might have heard it was estrogenic, but it's not. It does not promote breast cancer growth. So, black cohosh is a very nice herb to include because of its also being anti-inflammatory and um, if someone has had um, a hysterectomy or is going through menopause or is on some anti-cancer, anti-estrogen drugs, they go into instant menopause and black cohosh can help with that as well. So we try and ha pick the plants that do the most, that have the most benefit for what's going on with you. This pineapple looking plant is indeed um, pineapple. And within pineapple is a compound called bromelain, and it helps to digest protein, and it helps to digest something that causes clotting, called fibrin. And it works in the body in different environments, both acidic and alkaline, so that it's safe to take no matter what you're eating. <clears throat> and it has also really good effect on estrogen-positive um, high VEGF cells. This is, these are um, hormone positive and um, very aggressive cells. It interferes with the cell's growth in a way because it dissolves compounds that help the cell uh, continue to grow. So it, in a sense, prevents um, metastasis. And also, it helps the chemos work better. In the studies that they have shown, the 5-FU and vincristine were enhanced by bromelain. Plus, it inhibits a couple of anti, uh, pro-inflammatory compounds, COX-2, and that bad one, nuclear factor kappa B, it stops that, and then it protects the p53 gene, which was the one that is anti-cancer. So, because of its multitasking activity, this is a wonderful protein. Plus, it's a wonderful um, uh, herb. Plus, it's really good for digestion as well. This beautiful purple plant uh, flower, in flower is milk thistle. It's a thistle, like many, 
and there's a compound from it called silymarin, which is extracted, and that's the thing that is mostly sold as a supplement. And that that extracted and concentrated compound, silymarin, um, helps to reduce the, um, the the spread, and it also helps apoptosis, which is a cancer cell death. So it inhibited breast cancer growth in um, a cell study here. Plus, milk thistle is really good for the liver. So it was worked well with adriamycin in reducing both positive, estrogen positive and negative cancer cell growth. And it does reduce chemo and radiation toxicity partly because of its liver uh, benefiting action. This is uh, one of my herbalist colleagues, a man named Paul Stamets, and he has a company that um, sells mushrooms, and he has been um, involved with mushroom studies and uh, the benefits of mushrooms for many, many years. And he has a talk out, uh, he's one of the TED Talks out, I encourage you to see that, on how wonderful mushrooms are. But we're going to talk about some of them here in this little section. We're going to talk about a uh, mushroom called reishi, and we're going to talk about tramites, but many mushrooms have a cancer, breast cancer inhibiting activity. Um, especially this white button one, which is one that you can eat, which is also called portobello or cremini. And um, <clears throat> maitake, another delicious edible anti-cancer mushroom. So there's quite a few of them. So I encourage you to go buy the edible mushrooms and include them in your life. And this is reishi. It's not particularly tasty as an edible. It's a uh, fibrous and hard. It doesn't, you can't really cook it down. But it has been used for over 2,000 years in China. And they call it the mushroom of immortality. It has many, many benefits, including anti-cancer benefits. But it also lowers cholesterol, etc. Good for the heart. But um, that real bad one, the NFKB target, this particular mushroom was very, very significant in reducing that activity in invasive breast cancer cells. And it works on estrogen ER negative cells as well as estrogen positive cells, which is not something, again, that we have drugs for yet. So if you have estrogen receptor negative or triple negative, these are things that you want to include as supplements or foods. It also it enhances the chemo and reduces side effects. And this beautiful mushroom is called turkey tail or tramites. And this has been studied for many years, since the 70s in Japan, and they use it as a cancer treatment. Uh, they have an extractive compound called either PSK or Crestin that they have been studying and using um, in addition to chemo. And it had positive effects, especially in women with um, estrogen negative cancers. Again, those are the tough ones to treat because there's no real targeted drugs. They just get chemos, but nothing specific for them. So it extended their survival. And um, it was superior to chemo alone when they used it together. I don't know, those of you who live in New Jersey will see this growing along the side of the road. This is like the state weed. And um, it's Japanese knotweed. Here you see it on the right in flower. And here you see it in the center. You can see it has kind of reddish tinged stems. And um, it grows everywhere. It's a highly invasive plant. But what it is, is this is uh, one of the major sources of a compound called resveratrol. It's, resveratrol is also found in grapes and it's found in red wine. But a real cheap way to get it is by, they harvest the Japanese knotweed. It's made by these plants, all plants, under stress as a protective. So if we're under stress and we take it, it helps us too. It acts in uh, many, many different ways uh, through um, both inhibiting aromatase, that compound that converts uh, testosterone to estrogen, and it also helps reduce the cell, cancer cell death um, in both estrogen negative and positive cancers. And they did animal studies on this, and there's lots and lots of studies on resveratrol if you Google it. There's a wonderful resource called Google Scholar that I encourage you to use. So you could just type that in and then 
once you get into that site, Google Scholar, then you can type in resveratrol breast cancer and you'll see the hundreds of studies that come up. Or any anything in breast cancer, vitamin D, whatever. You can do your own research. Here is um, one slide that shows the different pathways uh, that resveratrol acts in its um, approach to cancer, both intervention as chemotherapy on the bottom and with chemotherapy and chemo prevention uh, basically helping to protect you on the top. So you can see that it just reduces uh, cancer uh, activity through many, many pathways. I love the plants because they are like, like us, multitaskers. And this next slide, this really pretty um, purple-tinged uh, plant, is turmeric. Turmeric is kind of my go-to medicine for lots of things. It's like a medicine cabinet in a plant, that and garlic. But for cancer, turmeric is incredible. One of the compounds in it, called curcumin, which is an extract from turmeric, not to be confused with cumin, the spice, targets, again, similar to resveratrol, many cancer pathways, even more than resveratrol, including those in triple negative and HER2 positive breast cancer. It's also useful for lung cancer and many other cancers, but we're, we're focusing on breast cancer here. There was a study that combined it with a compound from green tea, EGCG, and it, it reduced um, by 50% the tumor, breast tumors in animal models. So these animal studies are quite nice. This slide here shows that the, um, all these little lozenges with letters in them are some of those targets on cancer cells. And they're grouped according to their activity, whether they're transcription flat factors, inflammatory compounds, enzymes, etc., growth factors. Curcumin targets all of them. And they've done studies with curcumin and chemos, and it helps to sensitize the tumors to all of these chemos. So the science is there. So not only does it not interfere, but it makes the chemo work better. Um, so this is another way of looking at curcumin. Here it is in the center. Off to the right are pharmaceuticals, the COX-2 inhibitors, the like Celebrax, and these, um, uh, these are chemos um, or targeted drugs, and they hit just one target. And th these are the targets that they hit, VEGF or uh, HER2, etc. On the left side, this shows that turmeric hits all of these targets. There are at least 90 of them along with the targets that are uh, hit by the pharmaceuticals. So this kind of gives you a strong visual of how incredibly um, multi-targeted, multifaceted, and interventional that the curcumin is. I wish I could take questions from you, but uh, if you have them, maybe there's a way that they can be posted to the site. So we're going to go into some of the supplements, uh, something from the supplement cart. Yes. Again, as I had posted about the breast cancer herbs, here are some of the supplements that have activity against breast cancer or in prevention of breast cancer. We're only going to be going into well, maybe about six or so of these as well. But there's much more that can be uh, made available to you. Because you... Um, they say that you don't need supplements. They are meant just to supplement uh, a deficient diet and that we really, if we ate well, that we wouldn't need them. But it's very hard to eat well and there's lots of confusing and misinformation about what to eat these days in our culture. Plus our food, food supply has been um, tampered with in a lot of ways. So if you already have cancer or it, are at increased risk, then I really encourage you to add supplements. You need more intense dosages than you would get from your foods. You know, maybe the equivalent of eight heads of broccoli. These you can't get as a, as a diet, in your diet. So we want to make sure that your dose of these supplements is sufficient to, again, shift your inner landscape. If there's problems swallowing them, take them with the applesauce or open the capsule crush them or 
add them to a smoothie. There's lots of different ways to get them into you if you can't take pills. Some of them come in liquid or powder forms. I generally have my patients split them into morning and evening doses so that you're free from even thinking about them during the middle part of the day. So we want to plan the regimen around you and around what you can do, what you can tolerate, and what form is the best for you. Eat hands. Um, the first supplement is alpha lipoic acid, and this is again alphabetically. So this helps to protect against neuropathy, which is a numbness caused by some of the chemos. And um, so we, I encourage people, if you're going through chemo, to take this particular one because it helps uh, not only reduce inflammation but protect your hands and feet. In addition, it does have activity against that bad one, NFKB, and as a side benefit, it helps with um, sugar control, which is a factor in cancer growth. So I do encourage you to reduce your sugar intake if you have breast cancer or are at risk for it. And it does have other benefits in terms of reducing metastasis, and it works really well with fish oils, which are our next supplement. The, the compounds, the oils in fatty fish are uh, the omega-3 oils, DHA and EPA. They are essential for our life. They form um, the lining of our cells. They help to make our brain tissue. They, they, uh, they are what is on our um, neurotransmitter, forms our neurotransmitters, and they help our immune system. They help reduce weight loss during cancer. So they have many, many benefits. They're anti-inflammatory, and they're used in um, reducing the risk of all kinds of chronic diseases, not just cancer. Our cell membranes are made up of them, and so we need them in our life. Our body doesn't make them. We have to get them from our diet, and our fish supply has been compromised. So it's really, really important to get them uh, as supplements. Some of them don't taste good or repeat, so you need to get a good quality supplement that uh, will not be a problem for you to take. I end up putting mine in a smoothie in the morning, and I have a really delicious source of fish oil, so I'll put a tablespoon in my smoothie, and it's lemon flavored, so it just tastes delicious, and it doesn't repeat on me or anything like that. So again, fish oil not only is it important for our body, but it has a lot of anti-cancer activity, including um, reducing inflammation, which is a factor in cancer spread, and suppressing that bad one, NFKB. There was a couple of really nice studies, uh, especially in triple negative cancer, that showed that the fish oil stopped the growth of, growth of breast cancer cell uh, lines. And they have found that women that eat the most fish or that ha had the highest intake of these compounds had much lower risk of uh, recurrence compared to those who didn't eat fish or had lower levels. I'm sure many of you have heard about the crucifer vegetables, which this is a basket that shows some of them. These are the broccoli, the sulfury tasting one, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, um, and, uh, um, arugula, watercress, mustard greens, there are all of those that we love to hate, but they're so good for us. I listed this as a supplement because a lot of it comes in supplement form. Because in cancer you would have to eat way more than you could to get the benefit. So the compound, the sulfur compounds, of which there are many, um, there's one that's called indole 3 carbonyl, and that seems to be to be the most um, prevalent as supplements, or DIM, diindole methane, methane. So either of those are good. The DIM form seems to be the most easily absorbed, but these all help with reducing breast cancer um, cells. And they work through a variety of actions. They impact both the estrogen positive and negative cancer lines. They help the liver clear estrogen, which is uh, good for the estrogen positive ones. They are very helpful for um, reducing meds to the bone, and if you take them with vitamin E, it helps improve the absorption of them. 
So sleeping, getting enough sleep is really important because it helps our system, it helps our metabolism, it uh, lowers certain compounds. And if you don't get enough sleep, um, it does lead to a lot of problems, either thyroid, diabetes, cancer, etc. So the hormone that helps promote sleep is called melatonin. It's made in the brain, in the little tiny, tiny gland center of the brain, and it's made in the dark. So those of you who sleep with a light on, or with um, lots of electronic pollution, or with outside light pollution coming into your windows, or with a bright night light, or sleep in front of the TV, or the computer, please make sure you reduce those things. As humans, we're just used to sleeping under the moon and stars, or next to a campfire, so our bodies have evolved to make this hormone at, in the dark. So this hormone is not only good for helping our sleep-wake cycle, but it also is important for our immune system. It, in, regarding breast cancer, melatonin reduces aromatase, that compound that converts testosterone to estrogen, and it reduces circulating levels, free estrogens in the body. And people do better on chemo when they have uh, good levels of melatonin in their body. And it helps to reduce a lot of the side effects of chemo, including some of the things not only low platelets that are often reduced from the chemo activity, and some sores and um, neurotoxicity and heart problems. This shows how that, that melatonin impacts not only uh, systemic-wide um, health, but also breast specific health. This next is vitamin B, which is actually eight vitamins. You hear a lot about B12 and folate, but there's lots of them, and here they are. Uh, B1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 9, and 12. And then there's also kind of related ones called SAM E and choline. The B vitamins, they work together as a family. They do lots of things, but they are uh, specific to breast cancer, they help protect the DNA and they, um, they help to, uh, to make the body work better through a variety of means. Increased vitamin B12 and folate and B6 may also, they're shown to reduce breast cancer risk. Plus it helps the liver clear estrogen and it also is really good, it makes neurotransmitters to help our mood, it helps reduce anxiety, it helps make red blood cells and provide cellular energy. So overall, B vitamins are really important. Um, you need to take them with food because they make you nauseous otherwise. This is one of my favorites, if I could pick one. This is vitamin D. It's produced by the sun, certain rays of the sun, the ultraviolet B rays, and they activate the skin, which then sends signals through the body to um, to make, uh, to make actual vitamin D in the way that it can be used in the body. High levels of vitamin D are linked to lower risk of breast cancer. So I'm always asking my patients to get their vitamin D levels checked. And I want to encourage you, too, to ask your doctor to check your vitamin D because it has so many, so many benefits against breast cancer and uh, benefits the immune system. In addition, it's anti-inflammatory. Um, and it does help the body um, bring in calcium, uh, use calcium to provide strong bones, which is mostly how we've known about vitamin D. But vitamin D, they, almost all cells in the body have vitamin D receptors. It's that important. It helps our brain, it helps our heart, it helps, uh, again, with inflammation, and it helps with cancer. Um, when levels of vitamin D are over 40, it helps decrease cancer risk. I like to see vitamin D in the range of between 55 and 80. Our labs show the normal range between 30 and 100, but I like it at the high, uh, higher end, especially if you're at risk for cancer. This just shows that the higher end is lower cancer risk. So vitamin D in New Jersey, where I am, um, is not made from around November through February because the sun's rays are not high enough for it to activate that uh, vitamin, uh, the ultraviolet B in the skin. And very few foods provide sufficient amounts. So you can't really get it 
through your diet. You need to supplement. You will hear that vitamin D is toxic, which it is, but it is toxic if you took about 40,000 units a day for many weeks. So that's not something that anybody should responsibly be recommending. Sometimes pharmaceuticals will give you a 50,000 uh, units a week dose. But as humans, we're used to being out in the sun and we are used to having vitamin D on a daily basis. So I don't recommend uh, a once a week dose. I recommend an everyday dose of vitamin D, whether you're out in the sun um, in the summertime on the northern latitudes or if you're um, out in the sun in the southern latitudes, you don't want to get burned but you want to get at least 30 minutes of sunlight a day to make your daily dose. And again, have it tested because I have a friend who is a groundskeeper here in New Jersey and he um, is out all day, almost every day in the sun in the summer and his vitamin D is low. So that indicates that there's other things going on in his body that are using up vitamin D at a rate that's greater than what he can replace from, from his uh, sunlight. So get yourself tested and then um, talk to somebody about what your dose should be based on what your labs show, whether it's low or high. There are some conditions which are you need to use D cautiously in, and that's lymphoma, sarcoid, or hyperparathyroidism. And those are things to talk to your practitioner about. The next supplement is vitamin E. Um, vitamin E is not one thing any more than the B vitamins are one thing. So vitamin E is actually eight things. There's four tocopherols and four tocotrienols. And that means that um, what's sold as a supplement is usually alpha tocopherol, one of the eight. So you want to get a supplement, if you're going to do this, that has all eight of them. So you look for that. The, um, there are certain specific ones that are very significant for breast health. So that would be the gamma tocopherols and delta tocopherols. But tocotrienols are also important. So again, you want a full spectrum vitamin E. And again, uh, that helps with estrogen positive and estrogen negative. So again, there's no drugs for estrogen negative cancers. So these are things you want to add if you've been diagnosed with that. And that is the end of our supplement and herb section. But I have put in here uh, resources for you and their numbers. And um, these are things that you want to make sure to take advantage of. Do your research. And then some wonderful books. These are three books written by um, my colleagues. This Herb, Nutrient, and Drug Interactions book is a wonderful, well-researched um, volume that shows which and how often and whether any are um, interfere with your drugs. The Herbal Constituents, if you'd like to know about your plants and all the different chemicals that are in there. But most importantly, this herbal therapy and supplements that was written by my teacher, David Winston, whom I put together with Marilee Kuhn, who's a nurse, um, uh, PhD, author, etc. So this is a healthcare practitioner guide and it goes over about 70 different herbs and some supplements to talk about dosage and uh, ingredients, etc. So these are really wonderful resources for you, written by people that know what they're talking about. So here are the books. These are some wonderful books to just help your spirit. Uh, Kitchen Table Wisdom by Rachel Remen. And uh, this one, Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life, was written by a physician, David Servan Schreiber, who was given, who found out that he had brain cancer and was given a year to live. And uh, 20 years later, he's been, he was writing these books. So. This is a, these are both very hopeful and wonderful um, books to have as part of your, your resource library. And then I have a, a list of references from my talks that put, where I put this talk together that you can look up. And I will leave you with, um, you forgot a word, of Breast Awareness Month where the man is looking um, very positively at the balloons. So I wanted to thank you all for sitting through this and I hope that your ears aren't spinning and your brain isn't fried from, from the information and I hope it can just help you continue on your journey to health and to teach others 
and to change your landscape and to have a program that is personalized just for you and your own unique situation. So thank you very, very much.